welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today on the 20th of January 2018, the second recording that I have come to, to record to you part 16 of the Secret History of the Jesuits from Edmond Paris. Uh, even though I have a little bit trouble speaking because of my tooth operation I had last week, I decided to come to the table and do another reading of this book because first and for all it's getting really interesting it bothers me that I haven't had time to finish it yet anyway and second of all because tomorrow on Sunday I have an appointment in the afternoon with a client for a wine tasting that will take several hours riding there doing the job and riding back so tomorrow I will not have time to record anything so then I'm gonna take uh, the opportunity to record a second reading of that book the Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris today on Sunday, Sabbath, the, uh, Saturday, <laughs> Sunday, Saturday, Sabbath, the 20th of January 2018. And without any further ado, I will continue there where I left off in number 15. So if you are a new um, spectator, viewer of these videos, then I advise you to go to the playlist, The Secret History of the Jesuits, and see all parts that have been made in that book reading, and of course, especially the one that preceded this one, which was the 15th reading. We are still dealing, as it says on page 123, with the preparations of the Second World War in section 5 of the book, The Inter Infernal Cycle, and I marked here that the Mercure de France gave an excellent study in 1934 um, where to continue. Now what is the Mercure de France for you who do not know that? This is a magazine, a French magazine, Mercure de France, which was founded in 1672 apparently, as we can read here. Oh, is it 1872? I'm sorry, not 1672. It's 1872. And uh, we are going to read a citation or a quotation from this magazine, Mercure de France. Okay, quote. In the beginning of 1932, German Catholics did not consider they had lost the cause. But in the spring, their chiefs seemed somewhat irresolute. They had been told that, quote, the Pope was personally in favor of Hitler, unquote. Now, this is something new. <gasps> this was even written in the Mercure de France. The Pope was personally in favor of Hitler. 1932, speaking of Pope Pius XI, yeah, what have we read before? That he was the most German-minded of all the Popes and that he probably even was a Jesuit. Okay. And he was personally in favor of Hitler? Of course he was in favor of Hitler. What else should he in favor be of? Yeah. Another quote reads that Pius XI was sympathetic to Hitler should not surprise us. For him, Europe could settle down again only through Germany's hegemony. The Vatican had thought of changing the center of gravity of the Reich through the Anschluss for a long time, and the Company of Jesus was openly working towards that aim with the Ledakowski's plan, especially in Austria. We know how Pius XI depended on Austria to make what he called his politics triumph. What had to be prevented was the hegemony of Protestant Prussia, and as the Reich was the one to dominate Europe, a Reich had to be rebuilt where the Catholics would be masters. Yes, I'm going to mark this little text. I'm going to mark it in green so that we can really see it for what it is. Catholics would be masters over Europe. That's the idea. Now, listen, I don't want to go too big into this because I have done so in the earlier readings. I told you that the plan of the Roman Catholic Church was to put as it was said here, uh, the center of gravity of the Reich through the Anschluss, meaning through the combination of the German Reich with Austria, again, which happened in 1938, to put the political power from the south, Austria and Bavaria, over the whole German Reich. By that meaning, 
to make the whole German Reich Catholic again, because now it was ruled through Protestant Prussia. And Berlin was the capital, where actually you can say that, I think it is not wrong to say, that the secret capital of Germany always has been Munich, because from there all the Catholics come swarming into the rest of the country. Huh? So it says here, Europe could settle down again only through Germany's hegemony. The Vatican had thought of changing the center of gravity of the German Reich through the Anschluss with Austria for a long time already, and the Company of Jesus was openly to, uh, working towards that aim, which was the superior general of the Society of Jesus' plan, Ledochowski's plan, especially in, as we know, Austria. We know how Antichrist Pope Pius XI depended on Austria to make what he called his politics triumph. Now, how did he do that? They chose an Austrian to come to Germany and to give Germany a Catholic face again. Hitler was an Austrian. He was not German. He was an Austrian and he was a Catholic to the core. What had to be prevented was the hegemony of Protestant Prussia. That was ruling during the Second Reich from 1871 until 1918, starting with Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor, who threw out the uh, Jesuits in 1872. They were only back admitted into Germany during World War I, of course, because that was a Jesuitical, counter-reformational crusade against Germany. And as the Reich, the author continues, was the one to dominate Europe, meaning Germany to dominate Europe. Now, what do we have today in 2018? Don't we have exactly that, that uh, the European Union is dominated by Germany? If I'm not mistaken, Germany is the biggest economic power within the European Union. And who has the money has the power, right? So everything that Hitler wanted and did not succeed with uh, war, the Germans got 70 years later through economics. They have their power today. Of course, they are still straying, hold it. And everybody looks at the Germans as the madmen, and, and, and that's what they are. The Germans are madmen as, they, as long as we speak about the Catholics in there, as long as we speak about the Jesuits in there, as long as we speak about the people who are following the satanic agenda. And then we don't have to pick on the Germans, we can also pick on the English, we can uh, pick out Italians, Spanish, Belgian, French, American, every nation. As long as they have any allegiance with the Jesuits, they are bad people. And here, what had to be prevented was the hegemony of Protestant Prussia. Protestantism had to be conquered. Protestantism had to be exterminated. That is the goal of, of the Jesuits from their inception. When the Jesuits do not extirpate Protestantism anymore, they cease to exist. They cease to be Jesuits. That's the whole working of the Jesuits. So it says here, what had to be prevented was the hegemony of Protestant Russia, because a strong Protestant, a quote-unquote Christ-like, even though not 100%, but still, at least against Roman Catholicism, Germany, Prussia, was dangerous. Very, very, very dangerous. That's why they wanted to break the Protestant hegemony of Prussia. And the only way to do that is to quote-unquote import from Austria and Bavaria a power uh, structure and to settle that in Berlin, in the Reich's capital. Yeah? And then, of course, the Reich had to, re had to be rebuilt when the Catholics would be masters. Another quote continues here. In March 1933, the German bishops, meeting at Fulda, took advantage of the speech Hitler gave at Potsdam to declare, 
we must admit that the highest representative of the government of the Reich, who is at the same time the head of the National Socialist Movement, has made public and solemn declarations by which the inviolability of the Catholic doctrine, the work and unchangeable rights of the Church are recognized. Unquote. Von Papen leaves for Rome. Now, if you don't know who von Papen is, you will get to know him a little bit later on in this book, for sure. Von Papen is not only a Catholic, he is also a Knight of Malta, he is Jesuit trained, he is the Chamberlain of the Pope, and he even got that title back after the trial of Nuremberg. They did not even convict this guy. He didn't have to face a big sentence. But we are going to, be, uh, to that in the future. Von Papen was imperative for the Concordat that was signed with Germany in 1933 between Germany and uh, the Holy See. Yeah? Von Papen leaves for Rome, the author says here. This man, whose past is so wicked, becomes a pious pilgrim with a mission to conclude a concordat for the whole of Germany with the Pope. You know, there was already a concordat with Bavaria, as we read in the last part, in 1924 and 1927. Now they are going to make a concordat with the whole of Germany with the Pope. He too, von Papen, will have to emulate Mussolini's overtures towards the Vatican. In fact, the same happens in both countries. In Italy, the Catholic party of Don Sturzo, remember the picture I showed you of John Sturzo? Let's just go back there and I'm going to put it up here again. Don Sturzo. The Catholic Party of Don Sturzo ensures Mussolini's accession to power. In Germany, the Zentrum of Monsignor Kahrs does the same for Hitler. Kahrs we have had here in the picture. Uh, the forerunner of the today ca uh, Catholic Democrat... Uh, <laughs> no, it calls itself Christian Democratic, but it is Catholic. Quote-unquote Democratic Union, uh, the party of Angela Merkel who you probably all know. Monsignor Kass does the same for Hitler, and on both occasions a concordat seals the pact. As in Italy with Mussolini, so in Germany with Hitler. Joseph Rowan admits this as follows, quote, Thanks to Knight of Malta van Papen, Deputy at the Centrum since 1920 and owner of the party's official publication Germania, Hitler came to power on the 30th of January 1933. German political Catholicism, instead of becoming Christian Democrat, was eventually made to confer full powers on Hitler on the 26th of March 1933. To vote in favor of full powers, a two-thirds majority was necessary and the votes of the Zentrum were indispensable to obtain it. So they absolutely needed the votes of the Zentrum party, who was, which was led by Kass. Okay, The same author adds, in the correspondence and declarations of ecclesiastical dignitaries, we will always find, under the Nazi regime, the fervent approval of the bishops. Roman Catholic bishops. And those bishops that did not agree were seen as liberals and they were killed in concentration camps as so many other opponents of the Roman Catholic Church and of the Reich of Hitler. This fervor is easily explained when we read the following from von Papen. Now, this is a quote from von Papen himself. Listen. The general terms of the Concordat were more favorable than all other similar agreements signed by the Vatican. And the Chancellor Hitler asked me to assure the Papal Secretary of State, Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, later Pope Pius XII, that he would immediately muzzle the anti-clerical plan. Unquote. This was not an empty promise. Already during that year, which was still 1933, when Hitler came to power in January, 
and the Concordat was signed in July, apart from the massacre of Jews and assassinations perpetrated by the Nazis, there were 45 concentration camps in Germany with 40,000 prisoners of various political opinions, but mostly liberals. What did I just say? Liberals? I told you that liberal Catholics also go into the concentration camps and they were probably even the first to fill them because the liberals are an enemy of the ultramontane, of the Catholics who follow, who follow the politics of the Council of Trent and who are absolutely subjective to the power of the Roman pontiff. Yeah? Franz von Papen, the Pope's secret chamberlain, defined perfectly the deep meaning of the act between the Vatican and Hitler by this phrase worth engraving. Listen. Nazism is a Christian reaction against the spirit of 1789. Unquote. Yeah. I have to open this little text here and find the Civilta Cattolica quote. I wanted to read that to you already in the last uh, video. I'm going to read it to you here. The Civilta Cattolica, uh, which is a house organ of the Jesuits. So, so uh, let's just uh, look that up here, that we can have a picture in the meantime. The Civilta Cattolica, the picture that you see right here, is the house organ of the Jesuits and in that house organ of the Jesuits, La Civilta Cattolica, we read, quote, Fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. <laughs> Do you need any more proof that the United States of America is heading for fascism, when we know that the Jesuits founded the United States of America, don't get me wrong, don't, don't put words into my mouth, the colonies were protestant, but the founding of the government of the United States of America was Jesuitical from the start. George Washington was even, according to some people, the very first Jesuit president, Jesuit controlled president. Whether you like it or not, they were all Freemasons and led by the Illuminati at that time. That was the front organization of the Jesuits at the time of their suppression between 17, uh, 1774 or 1773, better said, and 1814. I don't want to go too far into that, but here the Jesuits say themselves in their publication, La Civilta Cattolica, fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Roman Catholic Church. Why is that so important? Because here Van Papen says, and I'm going to take a picture from Van Papen here, I haven't I haven't put that for, uh, from yet here. Von Papen, I think I have him. Uh, don't I have another picture with him? Just this one. Von Papen, no. Don't have any single picture of him. Okay, then let's take this one. This is of the Concordat. And there you have Franz von Papen here, the second from the left. He says here that Nazism is a Christian reaction against the spirit of 1789. Now, first of all, you have to understand that von Papen, who is a Roman Catholic, by the way, here is uh, Ludwig Kahrs, yeah? um, he is a Roman Catholic, he is a Knight of Malta, he is Jesuit trained and Jesuit controlled. When he speaks of Nazism is a Christian reaction, then of course you have to understand that it is a Catholic reaction. Against the spirit of 1789, well, that's the spirit of the French Revolution. Yeah? 
taking into account that the Jesuits always control both sides in 1789, the French Revolution was just the secular aspect of at that moment banished order. They play both sides to further their agenda. And if you want to understand that, then have a look at the video The Grandfather's Clock that you will find in my uh, playlist of Inquisition Update. And that is a video I think you find on all three channels, at least on channel 1 and on channel 3 you will find that. Nazism is a Christian reaction against the spirit of 1789. Means it is only the uh, antithesis to the Thetis. Because they control both sides. They control the Thetis and they control the antithesis. And thereby the synthesis, the result of these, is also theirs from the beginning. And when the author says that Franz van Papen, the Pope's secret chamberlain, defined perfectly the deep meaning or the hidden meaning of the pact between the Vatican and Hitler by this phrase worth engraving, I agree. This verse, this sentence, this phrase is worth engraving. Engrave it into your minds, engrave it on paper, keep it, show it, post it on other videos. Nazism is a Christian reaction against the spirit of 1789. This is how Franz von Papen, the Knight of Malta, the man of power behind the Chancellor Hitler, saw the Roman Catholic Church and explained their doings. Franz von Papen, the man of power behind the German Chancellor at that time, fulfills the same role than ever, that every um, that every uh, uh, how, how do you call that it's not uh, it's, it's not deputy president <laughs> uh, it's it's the uh, like um, oh, I don't know um, Ronald Reagan was president and uh, George Bush was vice president so that's the name, Vice President. That's the same role that every Vice President of the United States has because he has the real power, not the President. The President is just the open puppet. The real power lies behind that. In Germany here in the Third Reich it wasn't any different. Franz von Papen was the real power behind Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was a wonderful actor who could greatly do speeches and all that stuff, but everything was given for him. Everything was written for him, but he was a great performer. You have to give him that. Anyway, in 1937, Pius XI, Antichrist Pope Pius XI, probably a Jesuit, under the pressure of world opinion, quote-unquote, condemned the racial theories as incompatible with Catholic doctrine and principles in what his apologists amusingly call the, quote-unquote, terrible encyclical letter, mit brennender Sorge, with burning concern. Nazi racism is condemned, but not Hitler, its promoter. Distinguio <laughs> means to distinguish. There has to be made a distinguish, a, 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 a difference, let's say it this way, this is the English I can better understand. Um, there has to be made a difference between Hitler on the one hand and Nazi racism on the other. So, the Pope condemns Nazi racism, but he doesn't condemn Hitler. Who is the instigator of that? How is that even possible? Well, distinguio. We distinguish between those. <laughs> and the Vatican takes care not to denounce the advantages Concordat concluded four years earlier with the Nazi Reich. No, of course the Vatican would never attack that, because that gives the Vatican the power and the control over the civil power of Germany. Because the spiritual rules above the temporal, as we know already. Now, we're gonna continue. While the cross of Christ and the swastika were cooperating in Germany, Benito Mussolini set forth on the easy conquest of Ethiopia with the Holy Father's blessing. I already went into Ethiopia in an earlier reading of this book, so I'm not going to repeat myself again here, that Benito Mussolini was 
doing a crusade in North Africa into Ethiopia because there were a lot of Bible-believing Christians that had to be extirpated. Quote, the sovereign pontiff had not condemned Mussolini's politics and had left the Italian clergy fully free to cooperate with the fascist movement, uh, with the fascist government. The ecclesiastics, from the priests of humble parishes to the cardinals, spoke in favor of the war. Yeah, because the church only flourishes in war. One of the most striking examples came from the Cardinal Archbishop of Milan, Alfredo Ildefonso Schuster, who is a Jesuit, who went as far as calling this campaign, quote, a Catholic crusade. Italy, clarified Antichrist Pope Pius XI, thinks this war is justified because of a pressing need for expansion, unquote. Another quote says, ten days later, when speaking to an audience of ex-servicemen, Antichrist Pope Pius XI expressed the wish that the legitimate claims of a great and noble nation from which he reminded them he himself descended would be satisfied. Unquote. The fascist aggression against Albania on Good Friday in 1939 enjoyed the same quote-unquote understanding as we are told by Camille Cianfara, quote, The Italian occupation of Albania was very advantageous for the Church. Out of a population of one million Albanian people which became Italian subjects, 68% were Muslims, 20% Greek Orthodox and only 12% Roman Catholics. From the political point of view, the annexation of the country by a Catholic power was bound to improve the position of the Church and please the Vatican." Unquote. Now, when we read here that Camille Cianfara says 68% of the population of Albania were Muslims and 12% were Roman Catholics, that means actually they are of the same mind. Because Roman Catholics and Muslims are of the same mind. You believe it or you don't. I don't care. Study true history and the, compare the two religions which each other and you will see that. And I will. I do the announcement now already for another time. I will go on and read the book Queen of Heaven, Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam. That's the title, roundabout, or Queen, Queen, of, uh, Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam, Queen of Heaven, I don't know. It, that, the title is about that. It's about the Marian apparitions and how these Marian apparitions work to unite mostly the Islamic and Roman Catholic religions. Yeah? These satanic religions and what they all have in common. And when you read that book, whether with me or you read it for yourself, or you can go to the archives of First Amendment Radio, I think it is in 2009, that Tom Fress read um, that book, Queen of Islam, Queen of Rome, Queen of All, I think that's the title, uh, and you read that, then you will understand that they are in mind the same. So then you have Albania, which is for 80%, 68 plus 12, Roman Catholic controlled, against 20% Greek Orthodox, and these Orthodox had to be extirpated, of course. In Spain, the establishment of the Republic had not ceased to be resented by the Roman Curia as a personal offense. Quote, I never dared mention the Spanish question to Antichrist Pope Pius XI, wrote François Charroux. You know, the ambassador, the French ambassador to the papacy, Pope, uh, he, he continues the quote, he probably would have reminded me that the church's interests in that great and historical land of Spain were a matter for the papacy only, unquote. So that means nobody cares about Spain but I, the Pope himself, because Spain is the most Catholic country in all of Europe, historically. So this 
quote unquote protected hunting ground. <laughs> Speaking of Spain here, a protected hunting ground was soon provided with a dictator similar to those who had been already successful in Italy and Germany. The adventure of General Franco only started in mid July 1936, but on the 21st of March 1934, the Pact of Rome had been sealed between Mussolini and the chiefs of Spain reactionary parties, one of whom was M. Goicoechia, chief of Renovación Española. I'm sorry if I butchered the name here, look it up for yourself, I'm no Spanish speaker. Go Goicoechia, that's the way that I pronounce it. By this pact, the Italian fascist party undertook to supply the rebels with money, with war materials, with arms and with ammunition. We know that they even did more than what they had promised and that Mussolini and Hitler, Mussolini and Hitler together kept on refueling the Spanish rebellion with material, aviation and volunteers. German soldiers went into the Spanish Civil War. German war material went into the Spanish Civil War. You know what they teach you in Germany about that? Oh, that was only a little preparation for the Second World War. Nobody speaks about that it was about the installation of fascist dictator Franco. Nobody teaches that in schools in Germany. At least not to me when I went to school. And don't tell me that has changed, they, tell, they teach that now. I don't think so. Mussolini and Hitler kept on refueling the Spanish rebellion with material, aviation and volunteers. What is material? War material, guns, cannons, ships, planes, whatever they needed. And volunteers, soldiers even sending soldiers to there. Now, as for the Vatican, oblivious of its own principle that the faithful must respect the, re the established government, it oppressed Spain with its threats. Quote, the Pope excommunicated the heads of the Spanish Republic and declared spiritual war between the Holy See and Madrid. Then he produced the encyclical letter Delectissimi Nobis. Archbishop Goma, new primate of Spain, proclaimed the civil war. Now, uh, I gotta go into this Goma. Here is the picture. Oh, sorry. Here is the picture of Isidro Goma in 1930. So this is already a quite early picture of him. Uh, this Archbishop Goma that we read here about, he is the new primate of Spain, proclaimed the civil war. The prelates of his holiness joyfully accepted the horrors of this fratricidal, fratricidal conflict, fratricidal, sorry, fratricidal conflict, and Monsignor Gomara, bishop of the Carthaginian, interpreted admirably their apostolic sentiments when he said, quote, Blessed are the canons if, in the breaches they open, the gospel springs up. Unquote. <sighs> Blessed are the canons if the breaches they open, the gospel, if in the breaches they open, the gospel springs up. Well, uh, I would like to use the sentence and to put this bad one into a good one. Blessed are the Gospels, if in the breaches they open, the Gospels brings up. Well, that doesn't make any sense, and any sense, blessed are the Gospels, if, but any, blessed are the words, blessed are the actions of real Bible-believing Christians, that in the breaches they open, the Gospels brings up. The real Gospel of Jesus Christ, I would like to say it like that. Yeah? I'm just trying to find in everything bad something good. Blessed are the canons. Well, blessed are the weapons that we Christians use. You know, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18, put on the whole armor of God. Blessed are the weapons that we, Bible-believing Christians, use if 
the breaches that those weapons break open, the whole armor of God, the faith, <coughs> salvation, resurrection, the Bible, the true word, all seven, I don't know by heart right now, read Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, you will understand, when these weapons, the breaches that they open, the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ breaks up and people come back to Jesus Christ. You know, the whole idea of reading this book is not only to give you a historical lesson, a history lesson, also myself, because I learn from it too, but also to make sure that we understand the true and only word of God. We really have to, because this is the only thing that saves. This is the only thing that helps us. That's why I want to change that word, uh, that sentence that I just read to you, that green highlighted sentence there. Blessed are the canons if uh, in the breaches they open, the gospel springs up, to read, blessed are the weapons of the God of the Bible, that in the breaches that they open, the gospel spring up. I would like to read it that way, and I hope that you understand the gist, because the weapons, the whole armor of God, are not carnal, but spiritual, because we are in a spiritual war. Read Ephesians chapter 6, and you will understand what I mean. Now, the Vatican even recognized Franco's government. Who is Franco? Well, we have a picture here. On the 3rd of August in 1937, 20 months before the end of the Civil War. So they are still fighting in Spain to put fascist dictator Franco in power. And 20 months even before that happens, the Vatican recognizes the government of Franco that overthrew a legitimate demo democratic government before. Don't forget that. Before they had quote unquote the people had the power yeah and that of course the Roman Catholic Church overthrew like they always do today they call that regime change you know anyway Belgium going to another country was also looked after by Catholic action needless to say an organization eminently ultramontane and Jesuitical the ground had to be prepared for the approaching invasion of the Führer's armies. <laughs> because Belgium was overrun in, I don't know, a week or two in the Second World War. So under the pretense of spiritual renewal, the Hitlerite fascist gospel was diligently preached by Monsignor Picard, Jesuit Father Arendt and Jesuit Father Foucault. A young Belgian who was their victim, like many others, testifies to this, quote, At that time, all of us were already obsessed with a kind of fascism. The Catholic action to which I belonged was very sympathetic to Italian fascism. Monsignor Picard proclaimed from the rooftops that Mussolini was a genius and wished fervently for a dictator. Pilgrimages were organized to favor contacts with Italy and fascism. When, with 300 students, I went to Italy, everybody on our return home saluted in the Roman fashion and sang Giovinezza. Unquote. Yeah, we come into Leo Digre, the fascist leader of Belgium of the Rexist party. And we are going into that now for more than a page in this book. And I don't want to speak boil too many words on that because if you want to learn of the Rexist party and of Leo de Grey and Belgium fascism and how this as I always said a very very much Jesuit controlled little country here in Europe that to me is no coincidence Brussels is the capital of Europe which is also the capital of Belgium of course that this country is so Jesuit controlled also played a very important role in fascist Europe, let me call it that way, in the time of Hitler, then go to my playlist 
of the book Behind the Dictators, as you can see here, Rexism and Catholic Action. Yeah? This is chapter 11 of the 12 chapters of the book Behind the Dictators. And you will learn about Léon de Grey, who was the founder and leader of the Belgian Catholic Erexist Party, received Jesuit training in Louvain, Leuven, where I live here, just a few kilometers from, probably even in the same school that I went to. I have a playlist here, and in this playlist you can find all 12 readings of the book Behind the Dictators from Leo Herbert Lehmann. Yeah, he was a Roman Catholic priest who converted to Biblical Christianity later in his life and he lived from 1895 through 1950. He wrote this book, Behind the Dictators, or published this book in 1942 during the Second World War and all this chapter, 28 minutes reading, deals with Rexism and Catholic action, meaning the Catholic power in Europe during the Second World War in which they've chosen Leon Legre, who you see here on this picture, as the Hitler of Belgium. Let me call it that way. So this is why I will not comment very much on what I read to you right now, even though it goes about Belgium. Therefore I advise you to go and check out that video that I produced in the 11th chapter of the reading Behind the Dictators. Now the author continues here. Another witness says, quote, After 1928, the group of Léon de Grel regularly collaborated with Monsignor Picard. Monsignor Picard enlisted the help of Léon de Grel for a, particular, uh, for a particularly important mission, to manage a new publishing house at the Catholic Action Center. This publishing house was given a name, which soon became famous. It was Rex. Rex stands for king, by the way. Quote, the calls for a new regime multiplied. The results of this propaganda in Germany were observed with much interest. In October 1933, an article in Flan, which is a Flemish magazine, V-L-A-N, Flan, from Flanders, Flan, reminded us that the Nazis numbered only seven in 1919, and that Hitler brought them, a few years later, no other dowry than his talent for publicity, founded on similar principles, the Rexis team started an active propaganda program in the country. Their meetings soon attracted a few hundreds, then thousands of listeners. Meaning, what started up with Adolf Hitler and seven followers in 1919, when uh, uh, um, eventually led to uh, the organization of Hitler Germany, Nazi Germany in 1933 and this is the same that started here with uh, the Rexist leader Leon de Grel. Their meeting soon attracted a few hundreds then thousands of listeners. So the same thing happened in Belgium as it happened in Germany. Of of course, the author continues, Hitler had brought to the newborn National Socialism, as Mussolini did to Fascism, more than the talent for publicity. The support of the papacy. When you are supported in your political actions by the Antichrist, by the devil, you will have success in this world. That's what the sentence says with other words. Being on a pale shadow of these two, Leon de Grel, chief of Christus Rex, was the beneficiary of the same support. Christus Rex, yeah. Leon de Grel and the Rexist party. I think this is the best picture that I have from that. Yeah, the other one comes direct. Leon de Grel, chief of Christus Rex, was the beneficiary of the same support but for a very different purpose, as his job was to open his country to the invader. Means, the installed the, the, by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Jesuits installed political leader of Belgium, in the time between 1933 and the outbreak of World War II, was only there to make sure that there will be no resistance 
that his country, Belgium, was opened to the coming invader, Germany. This is why Ger Belgium fell within a few days. That's why there was no real resistance. It's not the soldiers' fault. It's the fault of the people who lead them, who have their plans, which of course they don't tell them. They say, oh yeah, we were defeated, yeah, we didn't have any re resistance against Germany. You had, if you wanted to, but when the leaders of your military don't want you to have success, you will not have success. What can you, as a little soldier with a gun, do? Not so much, eh? And of course you shouldn't do anything because you sh thou shalt not kill, the Bible says. But I think this is very important that we understand this here, that uh, being on the pale shadow of these two, meaning Mussolini and uh, Hitler, Leon de Grey was the beneficiary of the same support, meaning of the support from the Roman Catholic Church, but for a very different purpose. And that was not that he was to become a equal leader as Mussolini, as Franco, as Hitler, but that he was only there to open his country to the invader. Raymond de Becker says, quote, I collaborated with the avant-garde. This publication, issued by Monsignor Picard, aimed at breaking the ties uniting Belgium, France and England. You know, when there is a unity between Belgium, France and England, um, this had to be broken up because France was, was anti-Jesuitical and England was Protestant. So there cannot be a unity between Belgium, France and England at that time. Yeah? We know how quickly the German armies defeated the Belgian defense, betrayed by the clerical fifth column. Maybe we remember also that the Apostle of Christus Rex, donning the German uniform, went accompanied by much publicity to, quote, fight on the Eastern Front, unquote, at the head of his Waffen-SS, recruited mainly amongst the youth of Catholic action. Then an opportune retreat enabled him to reach Spain. But before that, he gave full vent to his patriotic feelings for the last time. Now, the author mentions here a Belgium city, Anvers. And this is a translation mistake because this deals with the city of Antwerp, which you probably know under the name Antwerp, but Anvers, the, the way it is written here with the yellow highlighted, Anvers is the English name of Antwerp. So I think that this is a translating mistake that the translators did not put from the original French, Anvers, the name Antwerp. So I will read Antwerp when it stands here, Anvers, and you will understand why that is. I have to change the picture and then you will understand also why this picture is on there. Maurice de Behaud writes, quote, Ten years ago, and that is speaking of 1944, because he wrote this in 1954, the port of Antwerp, the third most important in the world, fell almost intact into the hands of the British troops. At the time when the population was hands of the British... Uh, uh, at the time when the population was beginning to see the end of its sufferings and, private, uh, and privations, <coughs> the most diabolic Nazi invention fell on it. The flying bombs V1 and V2 that we know most and for all from the war on England, that Hitler sent these uh, this rocket bombs on England at the time, these flying bombs V1 and V2 fell on Antwerp. This bombardment, the longest in history as it went on for six months, day and night, was kept carefully hidden on the order of the Allied headquarters. This is the reason why, today, the martyrdom of the cities of Antwerp and Liège is still generally ignored. Quote, 
on the eve of the first bombardment, which was the 12th of October, some had heard on Radio Berlin the alarming remarks of Rexist traitor Leon de Grey. Here he is back into picture. Don't forget, why was he a quote-unquote traitor? Because he was working for Rome. He was not working for Belgium. Yeah? He, this, uh, this traitor, as it says here, uh, on the eve of the first bombardment, some had heard on Radio Berlin the alarming remarks of Rexist traitor Leon de Grey. This guy, the fascist leader of Belgium, what did he say on Radio Berlin? Quote, I asked my Führer for 20,000 flying bombs. They will chastise an idiotic people. I promise you that they will make of Antwerp a city without a port or a port without a city. And then you see pictures like these. This is only one of many more that can be found, but this is nothing in comparison to when you watch what happened with the firestorm after the bombing of Hamburg, or what happened to the city of Dresden when Bomber Harris came and killed half a million people there. Nothing in comparison, even with this Antwerp, but still, every bomb that falls and every person that dies is a bad remark. I promise you, says the fascist leader of Belgium, that these bombs will make of Antwerp a city without a port or a port without a city. Isn't that a fine leader of your country? From that day on, the rhythm of the bombardments was going to accentuate, catastrophes and disasters being the result, while the traitor Leon de Grel was brawling on Radio Berlin, promising cataclysms even more terrible. Such was the last farewell to his homeland on this on his monstrous product of the Catholic action. Obedient pupil of Monsignor Picard, Jesuit, Father Arendt, Jesuit, etc., the chief of Christus Rex, de Grel, strictly followed the papal rules. Quote, the men of the Catholic action, wrote Antichrist Pius XI, would fail in their duty if, as opportunities allow it, they did not try to direct the policies of their province and of their country. Unquote. Indeed, Leon de Grel did his duty, and the result, as we have seen, was in proportion to his zeal. We read, we read in Raymond de Becker's book, quote, The Catholic action had found in Belgium exceptional men to orchestrate its themes, such as Monsignor Picard, the most important Canon Cardin, Canon Cardin founder of the uh, Josist movement, a bilious ill-tempered and visionary man." Unquote. This particular one swears today that he has never quote, seen or heard unquote, his fellow member Leon de Grey. So, these two leaders of the Belgian Catholic Action, both working under the crook of Cardinal van Rooy, had apparently never met. By what miracle! I mean, who do you think you can sell a story like that? Of course, the former canon doesn't tell us. Since then, he has been made Monsignor by Pius XII and director of the Josist movements for the whole world. Another miracle. Nor has Monsignor Cardin ever met the disreputable chief of Rex during the great congress described by de Grey. Quote, I remember the great congress of the Catholic youth in Br at Brussels in 1930. I was behind Monsignor Picard, who himself was at the site of Cardinal van Rooy. 100,000 youths had marched past us for two hours, cheering the religious authorities assembled on the platform." Unquote. Where then was the head of the JOC hiding? Those whose troops were taking part in that gigantic march past? 
was it through a special decree of providence that these two men were condemned to rub shoulders without seeing each other on official platforms as well as at the Catholic Action Center, which they attended constantly? Monsignor Cardine, of course a Jesuit, goes even further. He pretends to have also verbally fought Rexism. Really, this Catholic action was a peculiar organization. Not only were the chiefs of its two principal movements, JOC or Josist, and Rex playing hide and seek in the corridors, but also one could, as he says, fight what the other didn't, uh, did with the full approval of the hierarchy. I'm going to put this picture up here again of De Grel. This fact, coming up now, cannot be disputed. De Grel was put at the head of Rex by Monsignor Picard himself, under the authority of Cardinal van Rooy and the apostolic nuncio Monsignor Micara. So, according to Monsignor Cardin, he keenly disapproved of the actions of his colleague in Catholic action under the patronage, like himself, of Belgium's primate, and without any consideration for the nuncios, his protector and, reserve, uh, and revered friend, according to Pius XII." Unquote. We can read that in La Croix, also a magazine I've mentioned earlier in this book reading. The assertion is rather severe. We are even more aware of it when we examine, uh, when we examine what was the attitude after Hitler's invasion of Belgium of those such as Monsignor Cardin and his associates who today repudiate de Grel and Rexism. In a book which was put under the bushel, <laughs> nice way to hide something, when it was published, the chief of Rex himself refreshed memoirs, as we shall see, or refreshed memories, as we shall see, and, to our knowledge, what he said was never refuted. Never refuted. Being a fervent Christian, or probably even better said Catholic, and acquainted with the interpretations of spiritual and temporal, I would not have considered collaborating with Hitler for without first consulting the religious authorities of my country. I had asked for an interview with his eminence, Cardinal van Rooy. The Cardinal received me in a friendly manner one morning at the Episcopal Palace of Malin, which is Mechelen, which is some 30 kilometers from where I live. He is animated by a total and cyclonic fanaticism. If he had lived a few centuries earlier, he would have, while signing the Magnificat, put the infidels to the sword, or burned, or let fall into the convent dungeons the not-so-obedient sheep of his flock. As it is the 20th century, he only has the crozier, but makes it accomplish a great work. For him, everything was important, as long as it served the Church's interests. If it was something good, we would support it, but anything bad was crushed, and the Church has so many avenues of service, her works, parties, newspapers, agricultural cooperatives, meaning the Burenbond, banking institutions which assured the temporal power of the divine institution. And now I can sincerely and honestly say that this was the meaning of the Cardinal's remarks. Quote, Collaboration was the proper thing to do. In fact, the only thing a sensible person would do. During the whole interview, he didn't even consider that another attitude could be possible, for the Cardinal in the autumn of 1940 was the war was finished. He didn't even mention the name English to utter the supposition that an Allied recovery was conceivable. The Cardinal did not think that, politically, anything else but collaboration was possible. He did not object to any of my conceptions and projects. He would have, he could have, or should have, warned me if he thought my ideas concerning politics were going astray, as I had come for his advice. Before I left, the Cardinal gave me his paternal blessings, quote, 
Other Catholics as well in the autumn of 1940 looked toward the great tower of Saint Rambaud. Many entered the episcopal palaces, a palace to ask the advice of Monsignor van Rooy or his entourage concerning the morality, usefulness or necessity of collaboration. Unquote. And the quote continues, more than 1,000 Catholic burgomasters, that means um, mayors, all the general secretaries, even though carefully chosen, adapted themselves immediately to the new order. All those good people imprisoned or insulted in 1944 must have wondered in 1940, what does Merlin think? Mechelen, you know, this is um, the uh, seat of the bishop, so a very high uh, clerical seat in Belgium here. Yeah? What does Merlin think? But who would believe that neither Melin, their bishops, nor their priests had been able to put their minds at rest? Eight out of ten Belgian collaborationists were Catholics. <laughs> so that means that eight out of ten Belgian collaborationists worked with the enemy. And everybody who worked with the quote-unquote enemy was actually a friend of the enemy because Germany was Catholic, the invader was Catholic, and the collaborationists were Catholic. Uh, eight out of ten Belgian collaborationists were Catholics. During those decisive weeks, because of the choice which had to be made, Malin and the various bishoprics had ever issued, uh, uh, ever issued written or verbal negative advice to myself or to all those other collaborationists. Even though not very pleasant, this, in the plain or naked truth, the attitude of the high Catholic clergy abroad could only strengthen the conviction of the faithful that collaboration was perfectly compatible with the faith. In Vichy, France, the highest French prelates had their photo taken as they stood with Marshal Pétain and Pierre Laval, after the interview between Hitler and Pitain, in Paris, Cardinal Baudrillard publicly declared that he was a collaborationist. In Belgium himself, the author still continues, and I will find an end to the reading here very soon, because I've passed an hour. In Belgium itself, Cardinal van Rooy allowed one of the most famous priests of Flanders, his greatest Catholic intellectual, Abbé Verschrave, declare on the 7th of November 1940, during a solemn session of the Senate and in the presence of a German general, President Reda, quote, It is the duty of the Cultural Council to build the bridge which will unite Flanders and Germany, unquote. <laughs> Building a bridge to unite Germany and of Flanders and Germany, Building a bridge has always to do with the maximum bridge builder, Pontifex Maximus, the supreme bridge builder. Yeah. On the 29th of May 1940, the day after the surrender, Cardinal van Rooy described the invasion as a kind of present from heaven. Be sure, he wrote to the faithful, that we are witnessing at the moment an exceptional intervention of divine providence which is displaying its power through great events. So after all that, Hitler seemed to be nothing less than a purifying instrument providen providentially chastising, chastising the Belgian people. <sighs> Read this again. So after all that, Hitler seemed to be nothing less than a purifying instrument providentially chastising the Belgian people. Something very similar was happening in our own country, in France, where we were constantly reminded that, quote, defeat is more fruitful than victory, unquote, as before 1914, when a purifying, thorough bleeding was wished upon France. Before we go further into this, I will gonna make a pause here and we will continue the reading of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits next time um, in the 17th reading and um, up to here I found it 
quite interesting that we also learn a little bit about this little, little country, Belgium, which is little in size, but big in power. And therefore, it has something very much in common with the Vatican, which is also very small in size, but very big in power. And the Belgian Jesuits should never be underestimated in the European policy today. And now we learned that the Rexis leader de Grey, who was the fascist leader of Belgium during the time of the second uh, of, of the Third Reich in Germany, during the time of Hitler's reign, had only one purpose not to become a charismatic leader as Franco in Spain, as Mussolini in Italy, or as Hitler in Germany, but even though coming from the same support, the Roman Catholic Church, his only goal was to open his country for the invader, so that there will be no resistance when Germany wants to invade Belgium, which is needed to invade France, which is needed to punish the French of their anti-Jesuitism. Remember, that was the goal. There were countries to be punished during the Second World War. French, or France, the French people, France, because they multiple times throughout the Jesuits in the 19th century, England because they were Protestants, Germany because the Prussian uh, Protestant Germans were ruling Germany, that power was too strong and had to be replaced with the Southern, Bavarian and Austrian Catholic power. And of course, we have the Serbs in the Balkans, the Orthodox Church in the East and the Orthodox Church, of course, in the new formed Soviet Union in Russia. All enemies of the Roman Catholic Church. And at the final end, also the Americans come in after Pearl Harbor in 1942 and a lot of protestant American soldiers were cannon foddered and the Americans don't even understand that up to this day because they don't understand that all these wars were fomented by the Jesuit order and therefore it is very important that we continue reading in this wonderful book from Edmund Paris the secret history of the Jesuit order, that we understand the secrets of that order and by that we understand history as it was really taking place and we can make predictions to the future, especially for the Americans, that is very important that they see this future Nazi regime, this national socialist regime coming to their country and that they will see that they will be the next under the power of the Roman Catholic Inquisition. With that, I want to leave it for today. Thank you very much for watching, listening and commenting on the video. And until next time, Jogra 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, said God bless you and bye bye. A special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation, in 
and and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.